create new ways of presenting. And uh, we had Bob Wilson with us on uh, last week on uh, Wednesday, which was a fantastic uh, a conversation. And um, today uh, we continue our series with artists, uh, curators, and uh, producers who um, uh, try to make sense out of the time of Corona, create, create meeting, and uh, and uh, now after um, the immediate shock which we experienced last year, we did a talk was over 150 artists from 50 countries. Now it's all about what do we do now? What's last tune? What to do? Um, the big question. And with us today, we have someone who does something, John Glover, and John is also. Uh, how would you say a triple champion? He's an artist. Uh, he's a producer um, and also a presenter. So um, John Glover, as I read from his bio, which hopefully you all got, is a an expressive composer, uh, unabashedly expressive, they say, and he has created music for concert, opera, dance, and theater. And he has received commissions from the Houston, Houston Grand Opera, on-site opera, New York Youth Symphony, the Washington National Opera, Sparks, and Dwyer Christ, the Milwaukee Opera, American Conservatory Theater, and the Mirror Vision Ensemble. And um, he uh, has many upcoming uh, projects uh, with um, uh, artists uh, he is co collaborating with, and a new uh, music theater work with the American Opera Project titled Eat the Document, um, with his frequent collaborator, uh, Kelly Rook. Um, John serves as the director of artistic planning for the Kaufman Music Center here in Manhattan. This is why we have him here. He invented something, uh, the musical storefront, saying to Elizabeth Hayes said, you have to talk uh, to John. This is essential, what he does is stunning. And I have to admit, John, I didn't know what it is. So tell us a bit, what's, what's, what is the musical storefront theater? Or pop -up sure, performance? So, sure. So just a little bit too about, um, thank you for that introduction and just a little bit also about uh, Kaufman Music Center for, um, I know that m more of your audience tends to be um, theater rather than concert audience. So a little bit about Kaufman Music Center is um, we're located on the Upper West Side and Kaufman is sort of this whole ecosystem of what music making means. So we are, th we have basically three main initiatives here that I help uh, oversee the artistic guidance with or help coordinate the artistic guidance with. So there's, um, we have Merkin Hall, which is where we would normally be presenting concerts in our, in our 450 seat theater on the Upper West Side, um, which is our professional presentations. We also have special music school, which is a unique, collaboration with the Department of Education. It's a K through 12 public school, and we provide music as the central uh, curriculum component to that education. So, and it's, our high school is the only arts high school in New York City that provides composition as a focus for instruction. And then we have Lucy Moses School, which is New York City's largest community music school. So all of that is normally what Kaufman is. And my role as Director of Artistic Planning is to oversee presentations and the hall, but also to find ways that we can connect our professional presentation work with the wider sort of student body that also exists within Kaufman. Um, and so the musical storefronts uh, was one of the many ways that we responded to um, this, this last difficult year uh, where live performance has been a challenge for all of us. Um, and so we pivoted in a couple of ways. We did also do digital presentations, which we have going on throughout the season. But at a certain point, uh, this opportunity presented itself to bring live music back to the city. Um, and just a little context about musical storefronts is um, this is a project that um, it's certainly not my idea alone. And it's, it's, a, it's a real example of, I think, um, how things are always stronger with community and a group of people coming together to realize something. So in this case, um, there was an individual, uh, Jay Dweck, who was walking around the Upper West Side and noticing all the empty storefronts and sort of had this idea, well, why couldn't people be performing in storefronts? And of course, there have been a number of, initi number of initiatives over the years uh, where people do um, use storefronts for performance, whether it's theater or music. Um, and he approached us with the idea was sort of the broad concept, the idea, and the, our executive director, Kate Sheeran and myself, um, sort of thought into that more, hunted around for storefronts that could be a great concert hall, 
Um, and also the technical possibility is how do you really execute this? How do you do something that would be a really successful uh, performance? So there was this initial seed of an idea from Jay and then a foundation he's connected to the Alphadine Foundation, which provided the funding. And then on Kaufman's side, it's our presentation. And we worked through um, how to technically realize this curating of the artists and sort of running of the series and finding the storefront. Uh, and so the, the it's sort of that whole collaboration that's come together, including our location at 62nd and Broadway. Um, Milstein Properties and Milford Management is the landlord of that empty storefront. And they actually donated the space to us, which allowed us to hire even more musicians and present more concerts because uh, we weren't worrying about having to rent the storefront. And then we also had Steinway and Sons uh, donate a grand piano to the space. So it's this sort of shared collective effort to get live performance back to the city. Um, and as a quick summary of how it works is uh, we present the same range of music that we would present at Merkin Hall. So it's predominantly classical, but not only. There's a lot of jazz, there's Broadway and music theater, there's contemporary and experimental music. That whole range um, is being presented at the storefront. And we started on January 23rd, and the series is going up through April 28th. So we are presenting 107 concerts. Over 200 musicians are being hired, all being paid um, standard professional wages for the concerts. Uh, and there are two concerts a day, almost every day of the week. So uh, we have an artist or a group of artists do a set from 11 onwards, like an afternoon set. They'll do three performances of 50 minutes in length each. Then we'll, there's a break and then we do like a four, four o'clock on set with a different set of artists. So um, any day you walk past the storefront window, you might experience a completely different sort of short 45 minute concert from a totally different artist. Um, and how we accomplish it technically is um, it was an old clothing store that's been empty for over two years uh, on the corner of 62nd and Broadway. And um, we were able to convert it. We brought uh, microphones from Merkin Hall, um, purchased speakers, uh, moved the piano in, and basically uh, anywhere from a soloist to up to a quartet of performers can be in the space they're all mics, they have monitors, they can hear themselves. We have a sound engineer who's outside on the sidewalk who is monitoring the levels and sort of designing as if we were in a normal theater. And the speakers are outside of the window. So um, the audience that's on the sidewalk can hear the performance that's happening in the storefront um, as you would if we were in a standard theater. So that's sort of the broad look at it. Um, uh, it's also meaningful to me because uh, it's a, a whole range of performers were presenting, but one of, in particular that I think is, um, you know, vocalists, particularly right now, um, don't really have a lot of opportunities for live performance because of the challenges of this particular um, virus that we're dealing with, right, and that it's airborne. So uh, being able to present operatic singers, Broadway singers, we've had stars from Hamilton, from Tootsie, um, we have singers that would normally be on the stage of the Met, uh, they can perform at the storefront live for for people because there is this glass. There is a there's a way that it becomes a safe medium. Um, so that's sort of the broad broad picture of it. Um, and I could, if it's of interest, I could share a short sort of video clip that gives a good summary of a few performances and gives people a sense of what the storefront looks like. Oh, I don't, I'm, I don't think I can hear you right now, Frank. Yeah, he'll do it. Oh, should I? Okay, great. So I'll share. Oh, yeah. If you can great. find it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So give me one minute to share screen here. And that should. So this is sort of a summary of, this is gives a few highlights of the storefront. It's like about two and a half minutes. Go down behind the white car, go straight back. Straight up, cool.
gives a sense of sort of the, the scope of it is, um, you know, it, it really, we were trying, um, the idea was to be both a way to get live performance happening again uh, in New York, um, which for most of these artists and most of these audiences, when we started this in January, it was the first live performance that either side had experienced in, uh, you know, since March. Um, and part of it was really uh, to, to replicate or to replicate the theater experience as well as much as possible um, so in terms of the sound. So to have really high quality sound um, for the artists and for the audience. Um, and I think also uh, it's, it's been a great, it's nice that it's a free initiative um, and it's just been a really inspiring um, thing to do, especially in the middle of the winter when things were pretty, pretty tough. And, and the incredible thing is, you know, um, for anybody who was worried about, you know, where will the audiences go when we're able to come back and, and, and where is that engagement at? I mean, we have, I think we're still, we still got two weeks to go. I think we're over 17,000 audience members that have stopped in front of that storefront window to experience the concerts. And I think that number is even more remarkable because we can't publicize them in advance. So uh, when we started this, COVID restrictions were such, obviously they're loosening up now as we're further in with the vaccine. Um, but when we started this, um, it was really early days in terms of figuring out how to safely do live events. So um, we had the entire series planned out, but audiences wouldn't know in advance uh, when the performances would be. Uh, so it served as a kind of, it serves as a pop-up series, uh, even though we're just in this one location. Um, but I, I mean, even in our coldest days in like late January, early February, when it would be like 22 degrees, you'd have like a hundred people standing out there watching a, a 40 minute long concert, just totally bundled up. Um, and these aren't, for the most part, these aren't people who were planning to be there. They're people who were walking by to run an errand or you know, to get from place A to place B and suddenly there's a live performance in front of them and they just stop. Um, so it's been a real, um, a really joyful thing to do in this time um, and, and a, a real, affirmation that, um, you know, there is no replacement for live performance, really. You know, there's no replacement for that actual experience, so. Mm, incredible, really um, congratulations on that word. I hadn't heard, I wasn't aware of it, but as you said, you know, you can't really advertise it even now. It's not, you, only shortly before you will hear um, um, when it happens, but um, uh, it's an intervention in a public space, it is, also giving a sign that uh, you care about audiences, that you care about musicians, and also the chain. If someone has an idea, it goes to an institution, the institution has a funder, and then it's being produced. Um, so it's a real model that works. It's very clear, it's about one space. Um, one, one cannot cut, go around the question, you're close to Lincoln Center. Uh, so, um, how does that make you feel? I don't know. I haven't seen such an initiative coming from that gigantic big organization, you know, or am I misinformed? Have they, have they been? Well, I would say, you know, we're all, I mean, something I think about a lot, um, especially this year, but in general, you know, we're all, um, I mean, the arts at large are all part of this one giant community. And then, you know, obviously there's the, the music making community and there's many communities within there as there are of course in theater. And I, the thing I really keep reflecting on in this last year is just that, um, you know, we are all in the same ocean that is the, <laughs> trying to create work in a pandemic, but we're definitely all in different boats. And so, um, you know, I think each, we have this sort of shared challenge that we all are aware of, this broader uh, existential issue of, of having a pan living through a pandemic, which uh, none of us have done before and, and figuring out how to create art in the midst of that, which often depends on, at least in our fields, in live experience. Um, and I think we're all, the, the tools we have available to us are all different. I know um, there are a number of other pop-up initiatives going. Obviously there's um, uh, the New York pop up stuff has been going on, which is through the city and the state. Um, and I know Lincoln Center has now initiated a, a project called Restart Our Stages. Uh, so I think that has started 
already and I think goes mostly through the summer. Um, so I think with us, I think it was, um, we are a unique institution, I think in a lot of ways in that we um, are equally grounded in pro professional presentation, but also in, in deeply engaging with our community in a community music school that has students from ages three to 90, and then also a public school with a core curriculum of music. So it's, we're, we're connecting with communities in all three of those ways. And we're, we're a large institution, but we're, we're smaller than um, many of our colleagues on the Upper West Side. And, and for that reason, I think we're more nimble uh, in sometimes in, in addressing some of these things. So um, I think this was one of those elements where, um, you know, we're a presenter that normally works in a professional theater. So when this idea appears of, well, what if couldn't you take over an empty storefront? Um, you know, for us, the answer is yes, because we have stagehands, we have audio engineers, we have even like our front of house people and our ushers um, who, you know, haven't, haven't, we haven't had live audiences in our theater since last March. Suddenly they can all come into play and they can handle crowd control management. And, and so they can run a front of house on the sidewalk. So I think that's part of the uniqueness with us too, is that we're, um, you know, we're nimble in that way. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I know that there are other um, storefront initiatives happening around the city. Um, mostly I've seen it with theater companies and not so much with um, music presenters. Um, and the hamburger created a, a great uh, festival in some of the meatpacking district. Yep. So companies have done it, but still, the scale of your initiative is remarkable. And uh, one thing is the New York City, you know, uh, opera company. I, I know the Philharmonics have a truck. They go around. I actually saw one of the performances. It felt very small. The musicians were kind of looking to each other. They didn't want to talk afterwards. Someone was singing kind of even the show tune and uh, dancing on the uh, red truck they had. And it felt, it at least to me, it didn't feel appropriate in a time of Corona when people were dying. And uh, and to show, I feel what you are doing there in a way. Also was that glass, you know, there is something of interest there. This screen we look at now, I see you through a glass, the television and all of it. But in a way, it's a hybrid form, but people are behind them. You hear their voices, but through a great sound system. And what's missing, the absent is kind of highlighted, but you're still experiencing. And I can think this is a, why a hundred people stay below freezing, if you say they're all done, for 40 minutes to listen to a concert. It's remarkable. It's, I mean, I think it's, um, I think there is something interesting about, you know, um, like I say, we're, we're not the first to do something like to, to sort of re-engage a storefront, but I think, um, you know, like I can think of projects that happened around like RISD, you know, 10, 20 years ago that have done things like this too. But I do think um, there's, uh, when you're trying to, I think there's something about it that, because um, I didn't really, you know, we didn't really know exactly how it would come together. Would people really stay? How would the artists feel when they're performing? Would they feel like they're on display or would they feel really comfortable? And um, I think in a lot of ways, we just, we took all of our expertise and our knowledge and our best practices for what works to support an artist and what works to create a concert in a theater and sort of just made that translation. And so, you know, like, um, you know, bringing in incredible audio engineers that would normally be amplifying performances in our theater and, and having them do it there and, it, and making that translation. And I think also like, um, for example, the artists, um, when we thought through, how does this programming work? Like how, when you invite an artist to come do this, what does that look like? And so we, we really wanted to uh, create a situation that felt as familiar as possible. So you have a stage manager, you know, you have a, a you know, five minute call, two minute call, um, um, you do a short sound check, but also that we, um, we arranged it so that each, if you're engaged for a performance on the storefront, um, you're given a, um, a, a really respectable fee and um, that calls you to the storefront for a three hour period of time. Um, so there's a sound check in there and then you do three performances spaced out 
Um, and we then the adjustment, of course, is that unlike a normal concert, we're not asking you to do like a first act and a second act or something like that, but more um, like three shorter sets with breaks in between. And that helps for us both with spacing out audiences that we don't have audiences gathering for too long, um, but also the artists can get a breather. But in a normal, in normal concert seasons before this, if you were hired for a concert performance at Merkin Hall, or if you were hired to perform with an orchestra or in chamber group, that probably took about three hours of your time, right? It was, you know, you'd show up at the hall, you would do maybe an hour sound check, break while the audience is gathering, and then you've probably got a program of around a hour and an hour and a half of music with an intermission. So I think, um, I mean, I know these, these are kind of less interesting brass tax things, but I think all of those small elements um, created an environment that felt um, like a familiarity that a lot of us hadn't experienced in a long time. And I think that that allowed the, the artists to also feel um, just a little more enlivened. I mean, the other joy is that, you know, it's really, it's it's sort of like really elevated busking, really, right? I mean, it's, they're on a street yeah. corner performing music is what's really happening, but elevated in the sense that we can accomplish it at a technical level like we would in a theater because the performance part of the space is a controlled environment. Um, the sound is really good. The performers feel safe in there, climate controlled. They can hear each other very well. Uh, so they can really play at the same level that they would play if they were in a theater. Um, and then we can really control the sound and make it a, a very high professional level. So I think those things, um, you know, all, and yet at the same time, it's a free outdoor experience. So I think those things help it come together to feel natural. Um, and also, you know, it, it's, it's a general philosophy of mine when doing programming in whatever context I'm doing it. But um, in this case, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, once we had the generosity of the funding from the Alphadine Foundation to make it possible, and the generosity of Milstein and Milford for donating our storefront space um, and providing us with the support of like their super if we had issues with electricity and things like that. Uh, and once we have that piano, it's um, once all those things came together, it's really all reward and no risk. So you really just reach out to artists that you're excited about or that um, that you trust and just sort of say, okay, here's a storefront performance. Um, what do you want to do? What would you, you know, what's the thing that you've been wanting to play or what do you really want to share with people right now? Um, because obviously it's a free public event. So we're not concerned about ticket sales in the same way we would be in a normal presentation and things like that. Um, and so I think that too allowed it to be a kind of, um, it's sort of just like, uh, like this, like this fire hydrant of just all this creative energy that's been building since March and we just, opened it, you know, and, and it's, it's been incredible to see that um, some really deeply emotional experiences with artists that would come up to me afterwards and say, I haven't played in front of somebody else in a year. You know, I've played in my living room on Zoom, but I, I haven't done this in a year. Or uh, same with audience members. We've had audience members that have come up to us and just been weeping because they just haven't seen someone perform for them in, light, in real life. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's been, um, I think it's sort of hit the best of all possible um, aspects of, of being a really controlled, like a theater style environment for the artists, but also a totally open, available, free public experience in a, in a high traffic area of the city. Yeah, it is truly remarkable. How do the artists, yeah, did they did they try out things that normally wouldn't? Yeah, you know, it was a it was it was interesting to see a variety of responses. You know, we had some musicians that really thought. Um, I would say each of the artists that we've invited was definitely thoughtful about what the actual environment was. You know, they understood that it was a storefront. They understood that it was the public passing by that maybe people would stop, maybe people wouldn't. Um, and different artists had really different approaches to that. So we had like the performer who opened the whole series, Sean Lee, phenomenal violinist. 
um, when we invited him, he said, okay, well, I've been working on all the Paganini caprices, uh, especially over the pandemic. And I, I, you know, I've got them all. So I think what I'm gonna do is just, I'm just gonna play Paganini caprices. Um, and I'll sort of announce them as I go. And I don't know what order I'll do them in, but I'll just do that. And I think for him, he thought, you know, they're these really beautiful, virtuosic, incredible pieces, right? That he's, he's absolutely mastered but also they're all sort of tuneful and vibrant and short, right? They're all these sort of two to three minute things and, and it allowed him to, um, if someone stumbled across it and stopped, they could take in one three minute piece and then keep walking, or they could take in a series of them since there is this set of 24, but also because of these short works, he could um, kind of, Play a caprice and then talk to the audience and play a caprice and talk to the audience and have it be this really interactive and casual experience. Um, and then we had other artists. I had uh, Michael Kelly, who was a baritone, uh, who uh, and uh, he did a whole um, because I also offered to artists they could either do like think of one 40 to 50 minute long set and do it three times since there would be breaks and you would have different audience or they could mix and match, or they could however they like. And this, this artist, Michael Kelly, is a fantastic baritone. He actually went on a whole research thought about like windows and different, he's an operatic baritone, but he also does music theory, theater. And he thought through the concept of being through a window and glass and barriers, and also the fact that he would be performing from four o'clock to seven, for him it was four o'clock on, and so his first set, it would still be daylight. But by the time he got to his last set, the sun would have set because this was in February, uh, early March. So was, the sun was still setting earlier then. So he created a whole like three 50 minute programs that each were added. Like if you stayed there for the whole three hours, you had this three act experience of that reflected on the time of day, but also different ways of thinking about singing or reaching through barriers, uh, which I was totally amazed that that's where he went with it. Cause it's like, I mean, he put together a bigger program than he would have ever put together in a normal concert hall. It really was like 150 minutes of music. Like, and, and if you stayed for that full three hours, you experienced a complete show. Um, and I'm trying to think of a couple other examples of, um, some artists have taken it as an opportunity to um, collaborate or connect with pianists that they haven't worked, like some soloists, for example. Um, uh, we had uh, Akash Mittal, who's a fantastic jazz saxophonist and also uh, is the lead coach for our Face the Music program at Kaufman Music Center, uh, which is a youth ensemble dedicated to uh, only the work of living composers. So he's a jazz saxophonist uh, and composer and he took the opportunity because you could work with a maximum of four artists in the space. And since he had to do three sets, um, he took it as a chance to work with three different pianists. So he had a different artist join him for each set. Two of them were artists that he hadn't previously performed with. Um, and so I think that was that's a unique example also because obviously um, we're we're busy, but we're busy in different ways, right? So a lot of a lot of musicians that would normally be on tour right now that are based in New York, but would normally be traveling all around the globe and only here for a week at a time, they're all here. So a lot of artists, Akash is just one example, a lot of artists were able to put together projects or try out things that they haven't been able to do in a long time because normally we're all more spread out. And so in that way, um, it had a very sort of local feeling to it in terms of the art making. Incredible. So can choose whatever they want to do, or do you ask them? Um, within reason. I mean, we would start it as I gave them the the broad sense of like, we would give them the broad sense of it's a storefront, um, you know, the, the sort of setup. Also, the fact that you know that what you're going to be performing is um, people walking by in the street. So something that you think might draw people in or engage them. Um, and um, and just to be mindful of the fact that it is um, art that you're creating in a in a public space, right? So we're not, and it's a pop up. So we're not contextualizing it before. This isn't an audience that's coming specifically for one sort of thing. 
Uh, and then beyond that, really just ask them, what do you want to do? And um, some artists wanted to have more back and forth conversations. And some just said, this is what I want to do. And I and that that's where it would go. So um, yeah, pretty open ended in terms of uh, their options. Incredible. That's incredible to think about it. And uh, in a way, of course, also radical, you're outside your normal space. It's on the street, but it's not on the street. It's inside. Yeah. It's yeah. artist affected by temperature, weather, or whatever. But really great sound quality. Normally, it's not such a great uh, quality. Also, great performers. Yeah, yeah. And audiences are free to come and go, stay. Um, Robert Wilson is famous for his long seven or nine hour operas, especially in the beginning of his where the um, Live in Time of Sigmund Freud, and also Einstein on the Beach, where he would give to the audience um, the, the um, little, how would you say, hint, you know, aud audiences are free to leave and come back and take breaks on their own, you know, uh, judgment, which is a radical thing in a way to do. And uh, you, you play with, um, with all of that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's sort of, um, yeah, we do end up delving into all those things. And I think it was, um, uh, it was also sort of a learning as we go, you know, it was when, once we had this initial idea, then you just sort of solve the problems one step at a time. And, um, you know, there are things about it that were very clear to me from the beginning that would be successful about it. For example, you know, I have produced stuff outdoors before. And so just that huge relief of, well, if we're in a storefront, but it's amplified out, like, great, we don't need to, I don't need to worry about, I can't hire, you know, I can only hire certain kinds of instrumentalists, I can't hire, you know, you really, it left you as open as possible. Um, and because, you know, it's, it's an indoor space, you have a piano, um, which you can tune and maintain and make sure that it stays stable, which is, um, which is unique, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't happen, at, or it would be much more difficult to do outside. Um, there's just so many variables that you, you remove. And, and I guess the only, um, the only one that remains is will the audience stay engaged or not, right? Because the artist is in a position where they're gonna be able to go forward with the performance no matter what, rain or shine. Um, and the incredible thing was just to watch, I mean, there's really, you just watched audiences, didn't matter what the weather was, they just stayed with it. Um, so uh, that part of it was really, it was a uh, much needed um, affirmation, I think, especially this winter. And they are allowed to take pictures and film. Normally you're not allowed as an audience member, it's completely forbidden. Yeah, as we say, uh, you can't adhere to it. So it's also a meaningful moment that you, this is something um, special. What did you learn, uh, what you didn't know when you, or say this is something we discover and maybe people who are listening now around the country or around the world say, this is a great idea, we should do that. Um, what did you learn? What was important? What is important? Sure. I mean, I think the first thing that we learned, which I, I knew it before, and I think it's why I was so adamant about setting up this discussion in this way uh, at the beginning is, is um, it really, something like this only comes together uh, with, a, with a, a coalition of people. There's not one, um, one piece of this puzzle that you couldn't have had to make the whole thing come together. You know, you really need um, the presentation and, and performance and uh, experience of an institution like Kaufman that is also willing to be flexible and nimble and creative. But you need that you need that funder or that donor who's equally imaginative and and um, and excited and interested in an idea like this and um, and and again having the landlord rally around it they could have very easily said well you know if you have if you have a foundation supporting this you know we really need to charge you some kind of rent and for them they just saw this as they've had a space that hasn't been occupied for over two years and. Uh, they 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 really saw the value in just um, enlivening the space, you know, in just energizing that part of the city. Um, so I think that really that was probably the biggest thing to learn was just that um, the most joyful and successful projects, um, I think, tend to be ones where 
you really do have this coalition of people who each bring something really strong to the table and uh, create a collaboration beyond what any individual organization could have done. We might have been able to put on 10 concerts, you know, if I'd shifted some of my presentation budget from what would have gone to Merkin Hall, but we would never would have reached, you know, 107 concerts and over hired over 200 musicians. Um, so I think that's the big one. And I think the other thing that I learned is that, um, you know, it's, which shouldn't be a surprise, but it's a good reminder is um, it really, you really couldn't predict time of day, weather, and this may be unique to the pandemic, I don't know, but uh, time of day, weather, style of music, it, you know, the size of audiences really ranged. There was no sure, hard and fast rule. I can't tell you, I mean, there were days where we had someone at the window. Uh, we had like Jesse Montgomery, phenomenal composer and violinist doing all of her own original contemporary uh, work. Um, we had hundreds of people there for the performance. You have somebody else playing, you know, really standard repertoire, Beethoven and Chopin and, um, mm -hmm people would stay engaged. It really didn't, there was no, um, no hard and fast rule to what aesthetic would draw the audience in more than any other. Um, but I think what did really have an impact was um, just the engagement of the artist. And, and as if the artist was doing the work that they really wanted to be doing and that they were excited about and, and creating in an engaging way, then an audience would naturally be drawn in regardless of what what the art was that was being shared. Mm. Incredible. Um, so, you know, some people say about democracy and we feel, of course, the arts always have been on the right side of history. Most of the time they are the, on this complex struggle for freedom, for democracy. You know, so people say, well, countries often get the democracy they deserve. And some say, well, also countries get the culture, the music, the art. Um, and say deserve is a community is functioning as a result you will have great arts so it's not just whether it reflects the union it's just people say even about sports you will have great games if things are working you know you have great exciting things is the fact that the Kaufman Center is as a community it was a school you're in education right uh, you're into presenting and also creative work is perhaps that the big difference to a place perhaps from Lincoln Center um, where, um, and they do really great things. I don't want to say anything against them, but uh, you know, still you do, you did something that has an impact now. Um, is that fact, is it a working community and do you care about the community around you? Was it for the community around 62nd Street or do you think it was like, you know, towards the gods of music, we have to do something to celebrate the arts. So what? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, I mean, I think there are a couple things. I think, yes, I think the ecosystem of what Kaufman Music Center is, is really speaks to um, a lot of it. I mean, there's just the fact that you're, I mean, also, you know, like the fact that we have um, in pre-pandemic, like all these things are in the same building, Lucy Moses School, um, this community music school and special music school and Merkin Hall, they're all in the same building and they all the people who engage with us in each of those programs and projects, they all, um, much to our frustration sometimes, but we all use the same elevator. So the same elevator that takes you to the backstage of Merck, straight to the backstage of Merkin Hall and onto the stage is the same elevator that takes you up to a classroom on the fifth floor of the building where, um, you know, maybe your second grade child is going into their Dalcro's class to learn eurythmics and, and, and internalize how rhythm, musical rhythm works in their body. And so Joshua Bell and that second grader might end up on that elevator at the same day at the same time, trying to go in different directions, for example. And I think, um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think something about the fact that the full ecosystem is here at all times um, does, it just creates a special kind of energy um, where I think for one thing, I think you never feel like you're getting stuck. There's always a new idea or there's always an openness to trying something else. I think when you're at a place that has learning at its core, that is part of it. 
Um, and I also think, um, yeah, I think that I think that is that's probably a lot of it. Is that that kind of um, that that full ecosystem exists here? I hadn't really thought about that that idea before you brought that up, but I do think that that um, that speaks to a lot of our interest this year. You know, every institution is handling it differently, but during the pandemic, there are many presenters who have you know taken a pause or or sort of just stepped back and and have wanted to wait, and I think. You know, for us, back in March, um, I mean, one thing that we did say <laughs> um, amongst ourselves, because, you know, March and April was just so difficult, um, canceling everything and calling artists and saying, I don't know when this art, this show will happen. I'm sorry, you know. Um, so we did make this promise, like, look, we don't want to cancel anything ever again. But we did also say, you know, but we also can't stop. I mean, if we stop how will these students keep learning and how will we get artists performing and how will we maintain our community connections with our normal audience at Kaufman but also if we have to go online can we reach more audiences or the storefront for example okay if we can put on shows in a storefront for free and show the whole range of artists that we celebrate and that we present um we'll find new audiences. I mean, there are people stopping at that storefront that maybe have never walked into Merkin Hall. And maybe because of an experience they've had there, now they will. Um, or they'll seek out that artist. I guess what I should add to here, again, it's a more brass text technical thing, but um, at the storefront, so there's no, um, we don't announce the program in advance, but when an artist is there, there's a QR code at the bottom of the window you can scan the QR code if you have a phone, um, or we our ushers have small cards that have the information. If you scan the QR code, it tells you who's performing, what their program is, and then rather than um, bios of the performers like we would put in a normal printed program, we just it's the headshot of each artist and then a link to the bio on their individual website, as well as obviously links to Kaufman so that you can find out about our digital offerings and also you could sign up for classes that are in our school. But um, so very quickly and in, at any point during the performance, the audience can feel unencumbered to, they can walk right up to the window and find out who the artist is. They can get to their website very easily to follow them later. So it, it provides an opportunity for discovery, I think, as well, um, both of these artists and, and, and of what we do. So. Yeah. Like restaurants who adapted the QHR code. Yeah, exactly. It's like the, there are some people where I'd say like, you can scan that card. Like you can find, you can scan because people say, who's playing? Who is this? I'd say, well, that's, you know, Jordan Bach is this phenomenal violist, but you can scan that code. You'll get more, and you'd be like, what? I don't get it. And then you eventually you'd have to say, it's like when you go to a restaurant now and they'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> You know, there's something is changing and uh, something is possible. I also like the fact that it's not a fundraiser. Um, the beloved fact, actually, from the New York Metropolitan Opera, I mean, the, the big concert around the world, which was beautiful from, from people's home, but of course, it's also, also a fundraiser. And here you say this is a free offering. And in America, especially, we should not underestimate the effort to be doing and also appreciate and celebrate this gesture, what you guys did your funders, the building, uh, the spirit behind this, because it is for the people, by the people, and with the people, and caring about the community around you. And yes, of course, maybe also some will say, we support that center, something seems to be working, but it was not right away there. And it's so beautifully presented, the white piano, it looks like a, a shot, you know, from MTV. <laughs> You know, so you really put care into it and not say, well, let's do something. I mean, I saw also from some theaters, uh, pop-up performances on the, um, so one from the Vineyard Theater and the artist you know, was next to a subway uh, where the sound would come out. Uh, the sound thing didn't work. You couldn't see a really, you couldn't even hear the artist. The microphone was working, but there were about five fantastic cameras and it was filmed. And you know, it's going to be used for a fundraiser in a way, but it's great that they did it and they do the X, but they had no experience and nobody, people couldn't connect. Also the, what was presented was spoken so fast, um, so fast, uh, it was almost impossible to follow far away. So they were not thinking it through in a way as you did as the music people with that experience. 
Do you think the fact that you are an artist, um, and I think one of the great complications in American arts and culture is that artists are not really in the driver's seat. There's a lot of money for art in America. Some claim more than in Europe. Of course, it goes often more to great museums or the symphonies, and I love them. And it's fantastic that it should be. But often on the boards, there are no artists, and they are not making those decisions. Um, is the fact that you are an artist, uh, uh, did that make, did that tilt it to present this, or would the Kaufman Center have done that anyway, or, or would a normal arts presenter have said, yeah, well, you know, we can't do anything, theaters are closed, and uh, let's save some money, let's not pay anyone, and uh, so, so, so what, I don't know, is that fact that it, you're an artist that you felt we need to do something, is that made it, does it make a difference? I, um, I mean, I can't speak to what it would be like to not be an artist, but I will say that in the leadership of our organization in general, there's a great deal of that we have a number of artists, both on the board and in leadership positions. And I think that that um, I think that that is a crucial and important thing. I think um, our executive director, Kate Sheeran, who who also is, you know, a massive amount of credit for this project goes to her. Um, uh, and she is a French horn player. She trained as a French horn player um, at Eastman and Yale. Um, and she talks about, um, and I totally agree with her, she talks about the fact that, um, you know, running an organization or arts administration, it's like chamber music. It's like, it's the same thing as chamber music. It's getting, getting everybody together and, you know, the same way when you start playing music together and you figure out, you know, who, who are each of these people? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Where does someone need to lean in to help somebody else? Where does this, you know, it's one sort of joint collaboration. And um, so I think, yes, on that. And I also think, um, you know, I'm, I think it's a, um, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's, it might be a Peter Sellers quote that I'd heard at one point, the idea that, you know, the artists, you know, an artist is somebody who imagines who, who looks out into the world and sees, has an idea of something that needs to exist there, but currently doesn't exist, right? That there's, there's something that when they look at the world, they see that there's a gap. There's something that should exist there that, that isn't there yet, you know, that there's an imagination for that. And I think that that is totally crucial to um, arts administration as well. Um, so I think all those reasons, yeah, probably contribute to why um, when this first seed of an idea that came from Jay Dweck to us, which he presented it to a number of other institutions, I think, and it had never really uh, landed. And when he came to us and said, I'm seeing all these empty storefronts and I just, and I, I'm feeling so strongly that all these mu working musicians in the city that are just not, um, aren't working right now. And isn't there some way we can put those two things together? Couldn't we somehow in enliven storefronts um, I think he'd said that to other organizations and, and they didn't pick up on it. And when he said that to Kate and, and then we had a joint meeting him and Kate and I, and we were like, yep, yeah, we can figure that out. Totally. That doesn't sound crazy. That sounds like a great idea. Um, I'd also say uh, when you're saying about artists in the driver's seat, um, the chairman or chairperson of our board uh, this year is now um, Orly Shaham, who's a phenomenal pianist. Um, who also has um, two children who attend school at Kaufman, but uh, you know, a renowned concert pianist and also curator and presenter in, her, in uh, many uh, places, including the chamber music series of the Pacific Symphony. Um, and so having, and we have a number of art artists on the board, uh, Nikki Renee Daniels, who's a phenomenal uh, Broadway singer, uh, Natalie Joachin, who's an incredible composer and flute player, um, who has worked with our students. And I think having people like that on your board and in leadership positions, having artists there mean that um, an idea like this doesn't seem crazy to them. You know, when you say, okay, well, we, we've gotten this funding, we're gonna take over the storefront. They, they, um, they know what that is, you know, they're excited by that. So I do, I agree. I think that it's important to have um, people who are artists um, working on the administrative side of things. Um, and I, I, for some reason, there's a general feeling, I think, or sometimes I feel like there's a misunderstanding that someone who's an artist uh, couldn't possibly also handle doing 
production or administration or, or, or that side of how we accomplish all this, which I, I think is absolutely not true. I think most art making is a combination of you know, the imagination of, of wanting to create something that doesn't exist in the world. Uh, and also then all the problem solving that goes along with that and all of the community building that goes along with that and all of the, the collaboration and, and gathering uh, people and resources around you to help you realize that work. It's, it's to me, it's a very um, direct translation. Yeah. I mean, to one of the great let's say jazz at Lincoln Center um, is a great example of things do work. I went to Marsalis, was in a way also on the driver's seat. He said, I want to have that theater walk a special way to look outside and this one should remind us of the club. So he created something um, that made it also work and made it different. And um, so I think this is a significant um, 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 statement that's coming out from you. And it's also inspiring. We in the theater world also have so many theaters, whether it's the public New York theater workshop, who knows, that's the second stage and uh, where are they all? What are we doing? What could we be doing? And I know we are all also under shock. There's perhaps a lamp times a little bit less money in the theater and the experimental world. So it's not as easy as in the art world often or in the classical world. Um, uh, it gets more recognition from society and I think it should be cleared up. But still what you guys did is also beyond uh, just the, the money and it's not right to say, oh, they could make it. You had an idea, you recognized it, you put it into motion and something happened and it made a difference. And my guess is also you have deep roots in your neighborhood, right where you are, Andy. Uh, yeah, and this this has deepened them. I mean, this, this really, um, I should also, the Lincoln Square Business Improvement District, which our executive director, Kate, is a member of that, of that board. Um, how we found the specific storefront we found ultimately, because we were looking at a number of sites and many of them were challenging for different reasons. And then she was in a board meeting and just tossed it out um, you know, to the group there and said, we're, you know, we're, we have this idea, we're working on it, we've got funding, but we haven't found a storefront yet. If anybody knows of any that might make sense, and it just happened to be one of the people on that meeting was connected with Milstein and said, I think I might know a space. And so that, you know, we, we've engaged even more deeply in our community, not just audiences and the people in the neighborhood that who've passed by, but, um, but with, you know, the, the business improvement district people now a, a large property owner in our neighborhood is now has really produced concerts with us. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't have expected to say that to you a year ago that my key collaborator in a concert series is, um, is you know, is a property management company, but they've really been deep in it with us. What are the artists coming in? What's the schedule gonna look like? How long should it run? Um, and then also Bread's Bakery, which is just up the street from the theater. Um, they uh, got excited when the concert started happening and uh, they're music lovers. And so then they came to me and said, how can we help? What can we do? And I said, well, we can't, you know, because of COVID, we're being really cautious. We don't want to run a full restaurant or anything in here. So we weren't really providing craft services for the artists beyond bottled water. Um, I said, what if you do coffee and tea for the artists maybe, just because since you guys have all those mm -hmm. protocols in place, and they came back and said, oh, no, 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 we're not just going to do that. Like, yes, they can come by and get, they just stay there at the storefront. We'll give them free coffee. We'll give them free tea. But we want to do something else for them. So every day that there's a concert, our house manager goes over to Bread's, tells them how many artists are performing in the storefront. And then they get these gift bags full of like bread and like desserts and like, like these huge tote bags full of like enough carbs to feed them for two weeks <laughs> as a thank you. Um, so it's just like, it's, um, it's a, also a reminder how art can really galvanize a community. Yeah, and also that a property management company might truly appreciate or understand the value of art and uh, the difference it makes. And you guys really made a difference, but we talked now a lot of your service, of your work and of for other artists and we are coming closer to the end of the talk, but you're also a composer. Um, so tell us a bit about your work. And um, I think I ask you, I don't know if you have it somewhere to have, maybe show us a bit of your work. What are you working on and, and what inspires you? Where is your work situated? Sure, so I, I mean, as a composer, I and it might be why I've ended up in this position of artistic planning at Kaufman. Um, 
Uh, I'm really inspired by collaborative work mostly. I mean, I trained as a composer in undergrad and grad school, undergrad at Indiana University and grad school at University of Southern California. Uh, and I also did study classical saxophone, but my, my light bulb really was uh, one summer, I took an internship up at Glimmerglass Opera, which is upstate New York. Yeah. Um, and my job there was to coordinate a lot of the orchestra work and um, assist a couple of the, of the assistant coaches. Um, and then uh, one of the chorus members tripped, uh, sprained their ankle on the set for the production for Fanchula Del West. And they didn't have anybody else to step in. And I'm not a great singer, but I'm an accurate singer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not an operatic singer, but I can sing the right notes at the right time. And so they asked if I would jump in, and that was a real um, that was a real light bulb for me because I suddenly was in this professional opera um, production and um, watching all of the pieces that come together to realize that was sort of when I figured out, oh, this is the part of composing that I love, not sitting in my room all by myself all day toiling over a string quartet or you know was but creating collaborative work. And so that really shifted everything. And then I studied their dramaturgy a couple more, or worked as a dramaturg there for a couple more seasons. Um, and since then, all my work has been um, working with singers on chamber operas um, or working with dancers on sound design. I've done sound design for immersive theater work as well. Um, but that's really been my primary focus. Um, and the most, current, most recent work I'm doing in that vein um, I had a, a piece called Stay uh, that had been commissioned by Onsite Opera here in New York that was supposed to open this fall, which was an immersive opera theater work um, for a house on Governor's Island. And it was with, um, it's an acapella opera, so for eight vocalists, uh, one of which plays guitar and one of which plays a lot of kitchen equipment. And it was for 30 audience members and eight singers. and. It's sort of like if you take all the elements of an opera and operatic singers and merge those with um, a sort of an immersive theater project like a Sleep No More or something like that, where people can get divided into different rooms. We actually controlled where the audiences went. Uh, it wasn't totally free, but um, sort of created this immersive opera experience. Um, so that was the project that we workshopped right before COVID and then obviously hasn't happened yet because we're not getting in a small crowded theater with singers in your face. Uh, and then the thing I'm working on right now is a, an operatic ap adaptation of an, a novel by Dana Spiota called Eat the Document, um, which is uh, for eight singers and chamber ensemble. And it, uh, the novel circles around uh, the 70s and the 90s in America and looking at, um, in the 70s, a young couple who has done a series of actions or demonstrations against the Vietnam War, one of which has accidentally resulted in killing somebody, because of planting bombs at different uh, corporations' houses, uh, the leaders of corporations' houses, and they've accidentally killed someone, so they've had to go on the run from the FBI. So it jumps between there and the 1990s, where um, Mary Louise and her previous life and Caroline um, in her older life, she now has a son and she lives as a single mother in the Pacific Northwest. And her son has start is in his teenage years and he started listening to the music of her childhood, but as if it's his music, because that's what we do when we're teenagers. So he's listening to um, the Beach Boys over and on, over on repeat and sees a glimmer of something in his mother that makes him realize he doesn't actually know who she is. He doesn't know her past, he doesn't know anything. So. It's a piece that um, we're creating as a series of EP albums with American Opera Project right now um, that we'll start releasing next season. And then eventually it'll lead to a stage production, but for now we're developing the work in a recording studio because that's what we can do. Amazing. <laughs> quite, a, um, um, quite a, I don't know if you can show us 30 seconds or a minute of it or, or we go on, um, 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 but, uh, let us know about you know about the about the work um, and what you're doing. Um, do yeah, you I'll, I'll just let it. If, if you go to um, American Opera Projects um, uh, and the project is called Eat the Document, um, there's a great okay. like a sort of three and a half minute video there that summarizes the project really well. But I think it just 
if you if you head to American Opera Projects Eat the Document, you can find that. Yeah, how wonderful um, to see how you know you're able to combine all that create work and that uh, we always do say that um, the artwork and organizing work and community work it's so so connected. There is no a strict division, you know, if we have learned anything in the contemporary art, we now work living no longer in the postmodern world, but in the contemporary art world, where there are hybrid forms of creating art, of producing, and filmmakers make theater, theater people make films, filmmakers write articles, uh, journalists make a theater piece. So, and I think this is, makes it all richer and better. And it is in the sense of what Umberto Eco said, it's an open artwork. And I think it's a one great open artwork, the musical storefront. There's an ongoing long performance with some interruptions over the nights. And um, it is a great uh, New York moment, I think, that you create on the streets. It's unique and it's so meaningful um, for everybody. So really, thank you. Thank you uh, for staying here. And I'm sorry that I didn't know about it uh, before, but Elizabeth is, is that, you know, this is important. And she, is, she was right. Tomorrow we have Peja. Uh, Oh, um, wonderful. Pitch. Yeah, Pichich, and he will talk about his work at the Tippett Rice Art Center. You know him, I guess. And, yes, uh, I know him very well. And um, also share what they are doing. And uh, we, it's a bit uh, around the music world, what we are also taking. But I think um, we all have to listen and to learn from each other. And um, as you said, the storefront idea came also from the theater world, the great squat theater, a great Hungarian theater that left in the 70s. They were famous, they had a building, they performed everything in the storefront. People outside would watch while the performance would go on. Sometimes performers were outside, you never knew. And that question, what's real, what's not real? The old, age old question that a theater poses and, um, and they ever always had an eight o'clock scene where the company would sit down and have dinner because the kids, of the company, they need some dinner and uh, audiences were there and you, it was a fantastic time. And I think perhaps we are reconnecting to something that might have been lost and that spirit that you present there that is in a way New York spirit and the city will come back. This is a great city over centuries. It has been through many, many crises. I have my prediction is there will be perhaps a roaring 20s, the wild 20s as they called in Berlin. Um, but it will be different and it should be different. And this is a one way to it. I'm sure it also transformed in a way your organization to experience something that out of necessity, you created something new. And I think it will also change the way you do and think further on. So to our audience also, thank you for listening. And um, I hope uh, you also found that as significant and meaningful as I did. It's a great contribution and really also you have to think of it, it, what it means philosophically to say, use an empty space. Don't just have the space done by the expert. If you, you can't get in, even for young artists, use the spaces in between, open spaces, public spaces, make partnerships and create something and try also um, something else. So this is an important thing, something that perhaps also was missing in a way, um, how we didn't pay enough attention for those who did, but it's a great contribution in the time of Corona and I think also with significance for the time after Corona, the TAC, as we say here. John, thank you again. Really, thank you for taking it so seriously and explaining us. It's great work what you do with the Kaufman Center, all the people who support it and congratulations. And um, it's a great contribution to our series. Thanks to our listeners again for, for taking time. You know, uh, so much more is going on since we started last March and there were a few of these talks, but it's uh, meaningful for us, but also as artists, need to do great art, we also need a great audience, good audiences. So it's important also for the artists that you are there, listen and um, offer the arts uh, managers in that sense, John in his function there to know that people are interested, that they do care and support. So thank you for taking your time and um, see you all hopefully tomorrow. Bye-bye John and good luck with everything. I'll come soon. Bye-bye. Great, take care.